On the day after Pentecost is taken from the Epistle of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 18 to 23. Brethren, I reckon that the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared to the glory to come that shall be revealed in us. For the expectation of the creature waiteth for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him that made it subject, in hope. Because the creature also itself shall be delivered from the servitude of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. For we know that every creature groaneth and travaileth in pain even till now, and not only it, but ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption of the sons of God, the redemption of our body in Christ Jesus our Lord. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Gospel is taken from that according to St. Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. At that time, when the multitude pressed upon Jesus to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genezareth, and he saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And going up into one of the ships that was Simon's, he desired him to draw back a little from the land. And sitting, he taught the multitudes out of the ship. Now, when he had ceased to speak, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answering said to him, Master, we have labored all the night, and have taken nothing. But at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a very great multitude of fishes, and their net broke. And they beckoned to their partners that were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they were almost sinking. Which when Simon Peter saw, he fell down at the knees of Jesus, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was wholly astonished, and all that were with him, at the draft of fishes which they had taken. And so were also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were Simon's partners. <clears throat> and Jesus saith to Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And having brought their ships to land, leaving all things, they followed him. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Please be seated. And when they had done this, they enclosed a very great multitude of fishes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. St. Paul tells the Ephesians that all fatherhood in heaven and on earth is named after the fatherhood of God. You see what a sublime vocation it is, therefore, to be a father, to have given life, not only to have given life, but to nurture that life with a father's care. I say that this is the great absence, the great abscess in our own society, is the lack of fathers, the lack of fatherhood, actually. Giving life, yes, nurturing that life, no, not with a father's care. <clears throat> it takes an enormous amount of love for a man to part with his native uh, craving for independence and uh, his liberty is very important to him. And when he is willing to not give up that liberty, but to invest his liberty, <coughs> to invest his liberty in a family, in a wife and children, that must require a great deal of love. Unfortunately, there are men who are willing to have the benefits of these things and yet not make that investment of their liberty, not devote their liberty, their time, their talents, their energies to the service of God the Father in nurturing the life that they've given. God bless those fathers who are true fathers, whose fatherhood really does follow the pattern of God's own fatherhood. According to St. Paul, notice that it, the epistle to the Ephesians, St. Paul goes on to talk about the, the family and the love between the father and the mother, the love between the husband and wife that should be there. 
And he talks about that love between the husband and wife as being a mirror image of the love between our Lord and his saints. Ultimately, the church triumphant in heaven, that, that invincible bond of love that exists there. That is supposed to be mirrored in every marriage, especially those joined sacramentally in matrimony. <coughs> and that love then is supposed to inspire the children. They must learn from that love what it means to love. They must learn the meaning of authority, and they learn that from the example of their father, especially. Yes, from their mother too, no doubt. But without the father's authority, there's something grave missing, something seriously lacking. And the father must use his authority out of love for his children. Again, <clears throat> is investing his love in the life that he's given to form that up in, in the love of God, in faith, hope, and charity. That's a father's role. When you realize the gravity of all this, the importance of it, you realize why any society which has good fathers is going to be well formed. And a society which lacks good fathers, which there is this absence or abscess, as I mentioned earlier, that society is going to suffer greatly. Every good citizen, every good son, every good daughter <coughs> learns two lessons, as I mentioned, without which they will never save their souls. They have to learn what authority is and they have to learn what love is. And they have to realize there's a, an unbreakable connection between the two of these things as God himself designed them that authority must always be an expression of love and a labor of love. <clears throat> and when <clears throat> the children do not learn the meaning of these words, authority and love, they have a very distorted understanding of who God is, God as Father. They have a very faulty understanding of their relationship to God as Father, in whom they should see the origin of all love and the origin of all authority. And so, a society which has lacked that, that lesson, that great lesson emanating from their fathers, can often fall into despotism because it fails to understand the connection between authority and love. When authority is separated from love, it necessarily becomes tyranny. Our own society is tending that way now because of a very false understanding a very incomplete and defective, twisted understanding of what fatherhood is merely as a means of giving life without responsibility. God forbid that our country should go that way, but it is our fathers, it is our fathers ultimately, who um, have to lead the way. They have to lead the way. We need them. We need them on their knees praying to Almighty God. We need them to set that example for their families. We need them to be imploring Almighty God the Father. As you see in the Old Testament, so often fathers beseeching Almighty God for mercy for their families. We need them to rise up to the great and exalted vocation to which they are called, to show that true leadership, to recognize that their fatherhood must reflect here on earth the fatherhood of God. We need fathers who will... And not only can, but will do that. My dear faithful, it is only our Catholic faith that can really uh, inculcate that idea and show the true relationship we have with Almighty God the Father. There are certainly fathers, even pagan fathers, who love their children, who gave but a great deal of natural virtue. They, they gave what they could, what they had to give to their children. And it's very splendid. And the, given us many stories from the ancient times <clears throat> about fathers who had a great natural love for their children. How much more so than a Catholic father who believes that in giving life, he's actually procreated a human soul in the image of God, which is actually called to everlasting life in the great family of God we know as the communion of saints. How much more a Catholic father should be devoted to his offspring 
more than simply by nature, but by grace to realize the treasure that has been put in his hand and the responsibility too. An enormous responsibility. It takes a lot of prayer and sacrifice. Ultimately, it takes sanctity. A father is called to be a saint. And um, just as a, the priest himself is called father, he is called also to be a saint. And how far, how, how short we fall of that but so often. And yet we realize that our Lord himself can give that miraculous draft when we feel that we've labored all night and taken so little. We see the example here in Peter and James and John. Peter and his brother Andrew, James and John, their partners, sons of Zebedee, <clears throat> plied the waters of the Lake of Genesareth, known as the Sea of Galilee, elsewhere. And uh, that's how they made their living. They, and as you see, often by night, they plied those waters seeking fish with which to support their families. Peter did have a family, for sure. He had a mother-in-law whom Jesus cured by a miracle. <clears throat> and so when our Lord came to them, they, he was not unfamiliar to them. They certainly had heard of this Jesus of Nazareth. <clears throat> and when he came up to them and asked Simon in particular to let him in the boat and then launch out from the shore, Simon was a very weary man. He'd been working all night, again, to provide for his family. And uh, he was cleaning the nets of all the seaweed and all the fouling that had taken place all through the night, a very fruitless night. Simon wanted to go home to, to sleep. And our Lord came to his, him at his boat and told Simon, to cast off a bit from the shore. And Simon, Simon did, probably somewhat reluctantly. <clears throat> and our Lord taught from Simon's boat. We're going to hear a great deal about Simon's boat in the rest of the Gospels, of course, as you know. But after our Lord finished speaking across the waters to the people gathered there on the shore, our Lord told Peter to put out into the, into the deep for a catch. And that's where Simon voiced a certain amount of resistance, almost a, a mild protest. Lord, we've labored all night and taken nothing, but at thy word, I will do so. So he followed our Lord's orders. And of course, you know the result of that. The result, the nets were not only overfilled to the point of breaking both his nets and his partner's nets, but when they finally got the haul of fish into the boats, the boats began to sink. And so Simon's business, Simon's fatherly way of providing for his family was suddenly in great danger of being lost. <clears throat> the wall winding up in the water, the entire catch lost with the boats and themselves scrambling for their lives to get to shore. All of this happened very suddenly just in a matter of minutes. <clears throat> and this was quite terrifying. It was sort of like the fisherman's worst fear. <clears throat> well, in the midst of all this, Simon uh, somehow got <laughs> through the, these piles of fish on deck and went to our Lord's feet and knelt down there among the flopping fish and, and said to him, Master, depart from me, O Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Perhaps he thought that this was some kind of a punishment <clears throat> that he was undergoing, some great chastisement. And he confessed that he was a sinful man and he wanted our Lord to leave him, leave him alone. This was a great price to pay for his sins. But our Lord was actually giving Simon the greatest honor that he possibly could at this point. Uh, yes, they did make their way to shore and yes, they did have this tremendous haul of fish uh, to sell and to provide, but our Lord was thinking more of providing something else. He said to Simon and his brother, Andrew, and their partners, but especially to Simon, he said, that henceforth 
your nets will catch men. Your nets will catch human beings made in the image of God. Your nets will be cast throughout the world to bring in the great hall of fish and uh, to actually populate heaven. Now, Simon understood the significance of this, and he did leave all these things behind, and he went to follow our Lord. But again, as you see in the history of Simon Peter, he had a very hard time leaving the things of the world behind. And uh, you see him later on, the history of that bark of Peter, you see it being storm-tossed and uh, you see it being threatened, our Lord being asleep in the boat and being awakened to silence the waves and calm the sea. You see, at one point, our Lord even calling Peter out of the boat to walk across the, the storm through the howling wind and the crashing waves. And Peter actually would climb out of that boat at one time to walk to our Lord and then think to himself, wait a minute, this is impossible. I can't be doing this. And he began to doubt, and with that he began to sink. And so it is with Peter's doubt, it is always a matter when he begins to doubt, he begins to sink. Well, my dear faithful, we see the example of this Peter, that he was a man who started out making an act of obedience to our Lord. And this did, certainly should have made a great impact on him to realize, well, all of our efforts throughout this past night have been fruitless. And yet we see what happened when I obeyed Jesus, Jesus Christ. And you see this miraculous load of fish that's threatened to destroy my nets, my boats, my business, perhaps even my life. <clears throat> but Peter himself, starting there on that boat, casting himself down on his knees, confessing that he was a sinful man. We see there was a kind of portent there almost. <clears throat> we see how Peter ended denying our Lord and uh, shamefully, uh, cursing and swearing that he never knew him. We don't see our Lord calling Peter there to fall down on his knees and beg forgiveness there. Peter knew all too well what it was to repent. Peter knew the need to beseech our Lord for forgiveness and to set him upright again. Peter is a very good example for every father because every father must feel rather overwhelmed at times with the responsibilities, with the souls entrusted to his care, and he must feel that all of his efforts at times seem to be wasted. And yet he has to continually go to our Lord. Let's say, as Peter said to Jesus once when he promised the Blessed Sacrament, and all those other people left him. And Jesus asked the apostles if they would leave, and Peter was the one who said, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. This is what a father has to do. As we're willing to go to our Lord continually, to go back to our Lord Jesus Christ continually, and lay before him all of his cares and his concerns, a father can easily feel uh, that he has not lived up to the role of fatherhood, despite all of his efforts. But he has to realize from the get-go, he has to realize from the very beginning, even from the very day that he may, is married, or better yet, from the day he begins to court, he realizes that he's on his way to a vocation that is superhuman that is named after the fatherhood of God itself. He realizes that he's undertaking a kind of superhuman vocation. And he realizes that no matter what efforts he makes, that they will succeed in taking nothing unless God himself provides. So he realizes that his fatherhood is entirely based on the grace, the mercy, the love of God. And that's where he always finds his strength. That's where he always finds his direction. He finds it in his faith. He finds it in Almighty God, the wisdom of God. That's where he must always go. No matter what may happen, even when the boats are sinking and the nets are breaking, uh, the boat is 
overwhelmed with waves on the sea and our Lord seems to be asleep, he must continually go to our Lord and entrust his fatherhood to God. Or he must answer for that to God someday. He must pray with great devotion and great, uh, what should I say, perseverance for his family. This is the father's role. This is the father's job, especially to pray for his family, to pray for the souls whom God has entrusted to his care, that God's grace may prevail, prevail in them. So, dear fathers, you have undertaken a superhuman task, a supernatural task, actually, Take it upon yourselves, a vocation God has called you to, to represent him in a very special way here on earth. Thank you for that. Thank you for that honor. Thank you for that trust. Ask him now for the graces you need to, well, let your fatherhood here on earth truly reflect the fatherhood of God. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.